where you're spending money and the areas that, that bring fulfillment and joy to you spending money, don't reduce that. Matter of fact, look for ways to increase that amount if you want, but make certain you definitely do not cut it. And then look at other areas where you're spending money that doesn't bring you fulfillment and joy, but you have to have it just to live and, and to exist. And you look at that and say, okay, as long as I can maintain the quality of, of whatever that item is, if I could reduce the pricing that I'm paying by 20%, let's take that money and direct that towards our turbo margin as well. This episode is sponsored by Marine D3. If you want 24-hour antioxidant protection while giving your brain, eyes, heart, and overall energy a jolt of long-lasting nourishment, then Marine D3 is for you. This is my number one top-selling health product that I've sold over 500,000 bottles, and right now, 80% of our sales come from repeat customers. Marine D3 can flood your cells with an abundance of new antioxidants and nutrients that fights and repairs damage done to the cells during exercise, everyday living, and the natural breakdown that occurs as we age. After 15 years of research and over $39 million spent on clinical studies, a renowned biochemist has found one of the world's greatest antioxidants. It's called CNLP, hiding deep below the ocean surface. I took CNLP, combined it with a little-known omega-3 called calam calamarine, as well as vitamin D3, so that you can get maximum benefit all in one supplement. I'd like to give you the first bottle absolutely free. I just ask that you pay shipping and handling. At edokeefshow.com forward slash free bottle, I'll have a mini presentation that will share more about the supplement and why people are raving about it. Most importantly, it'll show you exactly how you can get it shipped out to you today just for shipping and handling. This episode is brought to you by Dormant Forces Insider. If you would like monthly big business breakthroughs, insider marketing strategies that actually work, and mindset secrets of multimillionaires sent directly to your door so you can have them in your hands and you can apply them, then this is for you. Now, you can test drive my Dormant Forces Insider Silver Membership for just one month free. If you love it, we know you'll stay with it and let it keep you in the loop of what's working inside my businesses and the other dozens and dozens of businesses that I mentor. Why would you go at it all on your own when you can use other people's experience than just replicate what works? Anyhow, right now you can test drive the membership for just $1 plus a few bucks shipping and handling by going to edokeefshow.com forward slash dormant forces. That's edokeefshow.com forward slash dormant forces. Hey everybody, it's Ed O'Keefe and welcome to the Ed O'Keefe Show. Today I am so thrilled to have one of my good friends, longtime mentors, and um, consistently oh, one of my longtime mentors in business, uh, in uh, finances, and in money, um, and just being an overall awesome guy, uh, Mr. Randy Davis. Um, before this call, I kind of did a quick intro, Randy, for everybody, so we're just going to dive right in. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks. Thanks for kind words. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for taking the, your time. I know you're busy. Um, I did a small intro before we jumped on. Do you mind giving everyone kind of a quick background on on who you are and how you uh, how you would best describe yourself and introduce yourself to the world? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that this is definitely uh, impromptu. Uh, I would describe myself as an accidental serial entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, I've always been fascinated by entrepreneurs and, and uh, had several businesses. And I've, you know, started then with the idea of running it forever. And, uh, and then the business would work out really great and someone would want to buy it. I realized I enjoyed the startup phase and so I'd sell and start over again. And then uh, I also realized that you have to be careful about some of the advice you get because uh, I, I started seeking out financial advice and, and – uh, you know, from the traditional roles, and it just it wasn't it wasn't serving me, and so I made some bad decisions and ended up bankrupt and homeless and had a chance to start over again. And so at that point, I decided I wanted to become uh, 
really obsessed with understanding the financial world and, and how to do things. So, uh, you know, I would say that I'm, I'm a businessman, and then I uh, developed an interest in finance, and then I started studying wealth acceleration and, and really modeling other people and doing a lot of trial and error, and then I entered, entered the industry so I could get behind the scenes and see what's happening there. And uh, so, you know, for over 30 years, I've just been obsessed with being a student and applying uh, how to grow a business and create wealth and how to manage the wealth and, and uh, make sound investments. And uh, as a result, I've had a chance to work with some really high-profile people. Uh, a lot of the, you know, I think several of the people I've worked with, everyone uh, on this podcast would, would recognize them. And, and uh, I've learned uh, right along with helping them. So. Yeah, so one of the, um, I think, topics I wanted to cover early on was, you know, when you, when you talk about building wealth and creating a wealth stra- strategy for people, um, you have some counterintuitive ways of looking at building wealth fast. Um, most of the people listening to this podcast are either going to be entrepreneurs or people aspiring to be entrepreneurs. And quite frankly, today, in this time of life, I think – there's never been a better opportunity to be uh, in control of your own um, ability to make money and, and build wealth. In fact, even if you work with someone else, you're still an entrepreneur nowadays, in my opinion. Um, let's go through, do you mind giving everybody kind of uh, an overview of you know, your, your thought process and what is uh, most important first, most important second, and what you like to see people focusing on uh, to to build cash and then to build wealth. Okay, sure. I, you know, I, I think that uh, you know the, the first thing is the person needs to really kind of assess uh, you know the area that they have strengths in. For example, you know, one person who might be building the business, and by creating that business, they're creating wealth. The other person, it might be that they're building a business, but it's really a highly compensated self-employed job, meaning that. You know, if they're not there pulling the levers, uh, the business really doesn't exist that much, but they're very successful and they're cranking out some serious dollars. So I think that, you know, the first step is which one resonates with you at the, you know, at the level that you really find yourself passionate and, and can become obsessed with. And by doing that, you're choosing the wealth vehicle you want to drive. And so one is that if you're building a business that can operate without you, uh, you know, that, that's, that's one model that you take. The other one is you operate your business as a cash cow and crank out massive income and then invest that income, uh, you know, so, so you can, can uh, you know, accelerate your wealth. And in both cases, you can become uh, wealthy on an accelerated schedule. Now, if you're wanting to, to generate, say, for example, if you want to become a billionaire or if you want to have a, a, a wealth-building net worth of like $100 million plus, you almost have to do that by building a business or leveraging you know, some technology or something. If you're, if you're wanting like $10 million or less, then you can do it by building a business or you can do it by generating massive income for your business and then investing that money. So that would be the first thing I would suggest is to get clear on, on what path you want. And I think most people are better served, uh, you know, in, in, again, unless they're trying to hit the $100 million mark. I think most people, it, it's an easier path to follow to become a highly compensated self-employed business owner and just crank out that cash and then invest that cash in the appropriate place so that it works as hard for you as you've worked for your money. That would be the first step. Uh, so you end, up, you, end up, you end up getting the leverage based on the, your investment strategy after you've created a cash, like you're utilizing the cash to then buy the leverage that builds wealth for you. Is that pretty much what you're suggesting in that? Yeah. Yes. And, and you know, and, you now, know, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to skip over. Let's go. So, when you identify like, um, like I, I caught finding your superpower, because I think um, you helped me a lot with this when I was in my early twenties, trying to, you know, I, I thought I was so dysfunctional, in so many ways, which I am, <laughs> but <laughs> you were. You were one of the first mentors who explained to me, like, that's good. You're not supposed to be good at all this stuff. And, in fact, if you, you know, the truly highly evolved entrepreneur or even high, I would say even high-functioning high person that I've ever met in any field, they realize, okay, I, I might suck at 97% of this, but this is like the one or two things I do at a superpower level. Um, 
How do you recommend people go, like what's your process or suggestions on going about finding uh, that superpower uh, and then applying it to a, a business or a wealth strategy? Okay, that's a great question. And, and I kind of chuckled when you said dysfunctional because as you were saying that, I thought you are the furthest person I've ever known as far as being away from dysfunctional because you know, when I first met you, you know, what, 22, 23, somewhere in that range, there was a quality that you had that right then I could tell that you were really going to, to uh, uh, accelerate your success and, and you weren't going to have modest success. It was going to be huge success. And so you, you demonstrated and exuded qualities of tremendous success early on, Ed. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's, uh, you know that, that's something really cool about you. And, you know, I, I think that finding that superpower, which I love that term that you have, uh, it, it is a process. You know, it's something where you, you work on it. I mean, here I am uh, decades later, and I, you know, I still am working on it and trying to distill down and get clear on it. And yet, if, if you're right. If you look at any, any individual that really has, has stood out and where we consider them a genius, you know, they, they found their, their superpower, as you call it, and they zeroed in. I mean, Warren Buffett, which, you know, I admire him for a lot of reasons, and, and one of the biggest reasons is, is he has this ability to simplify and when you can generate extraordinary results by simplifying, I think that's the person you want to pay attention to. And there's like a handful of, of activities uh, that, that Warren Buffett has focused on for over 50 years. And, you know, when you focus on five activities for 50 years and just keep focusing on it, focusing on it, focusing on it, you get the kind of results you see him generate. And, and you can go right down the line and you can look at Richard Branson. He's identified his superpowers. You, you can go and, and just you can start doing that all over. So I think you're really right. Uh, you know, that's what they want to look at. And that's, that's kind of what I was alluding to in terms of finding their, their wealth vehicle. There might be a person that really their superpower is building teams and managing teams and building an organization. Then there's the other person that maybe doesn't really, you know, they're good at that, but maybe they're not great at it. And uh, they're better off at, at finding opportunities and, and uh, you know, becoming that entrepreneur and creating the opportunities and generating massive cash flow. So, you know, one of the things, and, and, you know, you're aware of this, you've been involved in uh, that uh, uh, Dan Sullivan at Strategic Coach has something called Unique Ability that, uh, uh, you know, and his idea would be to, to send out uh, a letter to like 10 to 20 people that know you really well and, uh, and ask them, you know, what characteristics uh, do they notice in you that seems to stand out differently? Now, you're not doing this to get pats on the back and, and – uh, and all this, you, you, and you tell them that in the letter or the email that, that you're, what you're trying to do is you're working through this exercise and you're trying to really find what your strengths are and uh, so, so you can zero in on that. And you'll start seeing some trends. Of, you know, people will respond to that, and some of the responses you'll get will surprise you in a way that you think they're not relevant. Uh, you know, for example, when, when I did that exercise of sending a letter out to people years ago, one of the things that came back was th that they all seemed to trust me really, you know, uh, quickly. And I thought, well, that's not helping me. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. And, and, uh, and, but in reality, it did, because later on I was able to see how that plugged in, and that allowed me to pull together deals and opportunities and make them happen faster because it, it, that told me that I needed to be involved in that particular step of the process because, you know, I was authentic. People sensed that, and, and you know, they know that I have the warts and I have the, the, the pleasantries as well, and, and, and that worked well. Uh, so, so that would be one thing. And then I, uh, I ended up taking this, uh, uh, what was it, Discover Your Strengths Now. So I'm, I'm always taking those, those types of uh, uh, profiles of self-assessments and Kathy Colby, you know, the Colby profile, and, and I know you've done that one. Uh, and then there's that, that book that uh, was called Stand Out by Marcus Buckingham. And well, I have never I read that. Anchor, yeah. you know, now, I found that that one has evolved quite a bit because he was involved with the Gallup organization, and that one narrows it down and says, here's your top two things. Boom. And, um, you know, my, my number one thing is Pioneer. Well, that happens to fit in nicely with someone who likes to start a business, you know, and really gets juiced out of the startup. And, uh, you know, th then there was another uh, profile, and I can't think of it right off. This one's a freebie, and it was actually on Oprah's website. And uh, it was really uh, insightful to help me kind of fill some of the gaps. And I'll get that link and make it available to you. So if you want to send it up to your group or something or post it on your yeah. site. Uh, but but that, that's the first thing I would do. And, and then, I, you know, I started working through, like, what do I love to do? You know, what, what is it that really mm -hmm. finds my, my energy? You and I were talking here a week or so ago, and, and you'd mentioned that when you're in a certain area talking about certain things, your energy level is high. 
and then individuals that, that know you really well notice that when you go into this other area that you're still, you know, people would still consider you a genius at it, your energy level drops. So start paying attention to your energy level when you're doing different things and finding where the real joy and the passion and the juice comes from. And, and so a lot of it comes back to being self-aware and, and just starting to pay attention along with those other tools, and you'll start, start developing that. Yeah, and don't you think that, you know, because I've never heard Dan talk about this or Kathy Colby talk about it, but um, I, like for me, early in my career of being an entrepreneur, you know, I, I wanted to be a speaker. And then uh, when, I, when I started doing copywriting, sales copywriting, direct response copywriting, I, my value system required that I became very, very good at it. And I, and I was good at it, but then I noticed after like six years of doing it at a pretty high level, my, my passion for it, like it, it just, my, I think, is that, do you think that's a value system shift, like a priority shift where, um, you know, I now have the ability to hire someone to do it. And when it looks at my energy of, oh, I'd rather have someone else spend 30, 40 hours doing it versus myself, um, and, and, like, now at this phase, I'm going through another change where I can see I'm enjoying teaching uh, uh, and coaching and learning and, and kind of uh, d- devising concepts and ideas and bringing pieces together, um, mm-hmm. whereas whereas maybe uh, three years ago, four years ago, we were in the middle of the health supplement business growing, uh, my number one focus was uh, on our conversion rate, you know, within that company, and that was where the focal point was. And and, um, you know, is, do you think it's an evolving thing that it consistently, like, you just have to keep, um, like, it's a positive thing because it moves, if, you, if you're aware that it's always evolving and you're evolving with your priorities and stages of life. Uh, what's your thoughts on that? Since you're, since you're so much older than me. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's right, man. I, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm this ancient guy, but, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, there's something about that, that, uh, the wisdom that, that you acquire from all the mistakes that you make when yeah. you're on the planet long yeah. enough. Uh, you know, and, and so it's all good. Uh, and, and so, you know, what, what I would say to that is that you're right. It is an evolving process when you are still in that discovery phase. And so, like, if, if there's a shift, it could be that, you know, like as an entrepreneur, you do what you have to do to get where you want to go. You know, there, there's that, that, that kind of that mindset, and, you know, you, you delegate when you can on it, but that rugged individualism, and, it, I mean, you're, you're just going to be going. So the copywriting, my guess is that you probably, it really wasn't your, uh, you know, superpower. It was, it was uh, almost a superpower, and it was something yeah, that you're, yeah. you, you know, you, because you're a great communicator, you're a great influencer, you know, you, you, you inspire people. And so copywriting is just one, uh, you know, venue of that or, or, or medium for that. So I think that was something that you are really good at uh, and almost at the genius level at, but I don't think it's your true superpower uh, because when, when, once you get to where your true superpower is, and I, and I do think there, there's a, a process to find it. I mean, I, I, I just mentioned several tools we can use, and that will help you and will accelerate you getting there. But the reality is you have to start paying attention and just do things and watch how you're feeling. And, and one thing that I've learned is that if, it, if, if, if you find a dip in energy at any point in what you think is your superpower and, and it, you, you, you do not have a physiological problem and you're not you know, sleep deprived for weeks on end, and, uh, then it's probably not a superpower. You know, it might be, it might be an A-plus activity for you, but it's not yeah. a superpower because your superpower is going to fully energize you. And if you, if you go back to the example I gave of Warren Buffett, you know, he's done the same five things for over 50 years. Now, you know, Warren Buffett's 85, so, so you know, for 35 years he was trying to figure that out, and he still was trying to figure it out. He got pretty close, and you didn't find him kind of moving off to the left or moving off to the right. He, he's relentlessly done those five things for 50-some yeah. years, and he's, and he's still juiced when he wakes up in the morning to do it. So that's discovering your superpower when that happens. Yeah, I, and, you know, I think you and I can talk about this probably for a full day. Um, Yes. Where I wanted to shit. Yeah. I mean, cause it's such a, it's such a, it's such a nice, uh, it's such a, I think, it, I think I really believe that this, this topic of identifying your own superpower and where you're thriving beyond just becoming great. Because like, you know, I'm a huge fan of Tim Ferriss, um, Josh Waitzkin, mm-hmm. Neuro neurolinguistic programming. And quite frankly, you can learn almost anything at rapid speeds. 
and especially uh, and so very, very quickly be in the top 5% of the population. But in some ways, you can get stuck in a trap. You and I are talking about this too. You can get stuck in something that <laughs> you were just conquering, uh, yet everyone around you now thinks that's supposed to be your lifelong path. And, um, uh, you know, but your, your, your spirit or however you want to phrase it, uh, you're, you're really destined to actually go continue on your journey and do something different, right? So, um, right. So, hey, so with perspective now, you know, you, you, we've known each other for a long time. Uh, my, son, my son just rode by on his bike um, you know, off to football, and uh, as I'm sitting here in the backyard. Um, and with perspective and the wealth-building platform, right? Because, you know, when you're younger as an entrepreneur, the one thought I always had was that I would hit a grand slam and so much money would fly in at such a rapid speed that I would never have to worry about money, right? And the right. truth was when, when we had growths in our company where revenue was higher than it ever was, the fact of the matter was I was probably more stressed out, more worried about money than ever before. It was actually the opposite occurred. Um, and so having kind of a game plan and system prior to that occurring uh, and probably like a little bit more in the entrenches reality of how things might explode um, in a good and or bad, Let's go through, you know, a couple of your terminologies and your game plan. Because I think if, if, if you took any entrepreneur and you said, hey, look, you got to create your baseline, and then you have to focus on one, two, and three. And I know you mm-hmm. have a, a few thoughts on that. Can we hit those points? Because I was sure. even thinking about today, I mean, my companies have generated over really close to the 100 million mark or more in the last, you know, say, 13 years. And, and I... I was thinking about if I would have forced myself to take an extra 3% or an extra 5% off the top line before anything else happened, um, mm-hmm. how much further I would have been, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. But um, let's go through kind of your suggestions in, in a simple game plan that anyone could follow, if that's okay. If that's okay. Yep, that's great. And, and you know, just, just to wrap up the, the superpower concept, that fit nicely with that first question that when you asked what would be the first thing you do, actually get clear on, on which vehicle you wanted to drive. Well, by getting a sense of what your superpower might be, that's going to open up the doors. And, and I think that's crucial for you to kind of get a sense of which vehicle do you want to drive towards your wealth acceleration. And if it ties in with your superpower, you're going to achieve bigger, better results faster. So with that being said, you know, the, uh, uh, you know I, I think that the financial industry and, and for being involved in the financial industry for over 30 years, uh, it's not that they're a, a bad group because they're not, but unfortunately it's become very confusing and they make things look more difficult than, than what it really needs to be. Now, I don't want to dumb it down and, and make it sound uh, you know, so simple that it's not true, but, but you, you don't need all the reams and reams of, of uh, spreadsheets and everything else to figure out what to do. I think you want to concentrate on what you can control and then ignore the areas that you can't control. You know, we can't control what you know, China's going to do. We can't control what the economy's going to do. We can't control what the feds are going to do with the interest rates. So, so let's build a plan that you know, will work in tandem with that, but, but you don't make that decision. And so I think the first place is, is to start out with focusing on, on a term that I call the turbo margin. Now, we can actually back up before the turbo margin, and, and you alluded to it, Ed, the baseline. Uh, you know, I like to, to, for people to start out knowing where they're at. You know, I, I love the outdoors. I spend a lot of time in, in uh, the wilderness areas. And one of the things I learned as a Boy Scout is if you ever become lost, the first thing you do is stop, sit down, and try to figure out where you're at. You just don't keep walking and moving and, and, and rambling around. So my first uh, suggestion would be for the listener to stop, sit down, it's okay, what's our current baseline? And the baseline is the amount of income you have to bring in each month to provide uh, all the financial responsibilities that you have at your current level. And we call that your current baseline. So if you're bringing in a certain amount of money and that money is taking care of all your personal needs and, and any other uh, concerns you have or obligations you have, that's your current baseline. And so you want to know what that number is. And, and, uh, and, and that's letting you start to, to progress forward. Now, if you want to take it a step further, you know, a little bit later, you, you can turn around and say, okay, what's my, my desired lifestyle baseline? The lifestyle baseline 
And that's where you start building in that you want the vacation homes or you want the home on the lake and you want to do this and maybe you want to own your own island or you want to drive a certain kind of car or you want to help a, a certain organization. And that's, that's the dream that you're moving towards. That would, that would then move from your lifestyle to your dream baseline. So the key is, is just kind of getting an idea of how much money you're bringing in. Then what you want to do in terms of accelerating wealth and you don't really have to pay a whole lot of attention to the baseline, truly. I mean, it's a good place to start out, but I would focus on the turbo margin. And the turbo margin is a term that I've coined, uh, you know, we used to call it acceleration margin. But the, the point of, of the, the turbo margin is to simplify your life. And if, as an entrepreneur, you could say, my number one objective is to maximize the amount of money each month in my turbo margin. And this is an ongoing process. You just never stop. You keep trying to ratchet that puppy up and just get larger and larger and larger. And so the turbo margin, the, the, you know, where does that money come from? Well, we've all heard that old uh, adage of pay yourself first. And that's the first starting uh, point for the, the turbo margin. So you determine how much money. You mentioned if you would have pulled out 3% or 5% year, years ago, hindsight being 2020, uh, you know, things would have uh, been different for you than they are today, but yet you still are very successful today. And um, so you start out with, with the turbo margin, and you declare a certain percentage, and, and start right now. Come up with a percentage right now. If you can't set aside 10%, shoot for 5 If you can't set aside 5%, shoot 1% for 1%. But come up with whatever percentage you can come up with right now. Now, that number is going to change, because that's by focusing on the turbo margin, that's what you do. And, and you start setting that money aside as a turbo margin. We'll talk about what to do with your turbo margin a little bit later. There's other ways that you can increase your turbo margin. You can look for ways that, uh, like you're paying your income tax. Well, if there are some legitimate legal tax deductions that you can take that you're currently not taking, why not exercise those deductions, take the money that you've saved that you, you, that you would have spent unknowingly to, to Washington, and take it and redirect that into your turbo margin. You know, I, I was talking with someone from your mastermind group recently, and, uh, you know, they – They've done a, a great job at setting the entity structure of their business up uh, so that it would, would uh, minimize the amount of taxes that they had to pay. And, and that's, that was, that's a smart move. So, so you could turn around, you could structure your business entities so that you can then, the way you spend money, you can get tax deductions that otherwise you might not be able to get. You could turn around and do things like income shifting. And there's a lot of opportunity that an entrepreneur has you know, most entrepreneurs can, can free up between $30,000 on the low side. Uh, well, and, and actually there's not a high side because I haven't hit the high side yet, but I can tell you more often than not, I, I'll talk to uh, uh, entrepreneurs, and if they're doing like a million to, to $5 million uh, in sales, it's pretty easy to figure out ways for them to save another. You know, if, if they're paying, say, uh, $100,000 in taxes, they can cut that in half and do it in a very legitimate legal way. So that's another way, income tax reduction. And then we, at your, uh, one of your meetings, we talked about power spending. And power spending is a really great concept uh, that will allow you to, to fund that turbo margin. And the, the basis of, of power spending is saying, okay, you have a certain amount of money coming in, you have a certain amount of money that's going out, let's look at where you're spending money and the areas that, that bring fulfillment and joy to you spending money, don't reduce that. Matter of fact, look for ways to increase that amount if you want, but make certain you definitely do not cut it. And then look at other areas where you're spending money that doesn't bring you fulfillment and joy, but you have to have it just to live and, and to exist. And you look at that and say, okay, as long as I can maintain the quality of, of whatever that item is, if I could reduce the pricing that I'm paying by 20%, let's take that money and direct that towards our turbo margin as well. And that's a real powerful tool. So there's, there's a lot. You know, I, I shared five at your workshop, and there's a lot of different ways you, you can increase that turbo margin. Now, once you increase the turbo margin, what do you do? Well, you know, some people, I, in the past, I would recommend that you focus on paying all the debt off first. Now, again, this comes back to knowing yourself. If you're trying to accelerate wealth and you have less than 18 years, you know, if you're wanting to, to become a multi, multi, multi-millionaire in 10 years or less, you probably, in most cases, will, will bypass paying off the debt early and just drive your turbo margin towards uh, an ambitious investment program. 
So that kind of depends on, on a person. But I can tell you that all things being equal, I would encourage you to pay off debt before investing. And then once you have the debt paid off, drive that money into your investments. Yeah, and, and that's kind of – isn't that kind of a, a arguable co- topic based on, A, the individual, and, B, like how low interest rates are, <laughs> like, for yeah. example, right now versus uh, when they're higher, and you know. It, it, it is. Fair, it, yeah, it is. You know, there, there's a science and the art to it. I mean, some people would argue that there's a time value of money. You're better off to pay off, the, you know, the high interest stuff. And, you know, so there, there is a discussion. And, uh you know, when, when you look at, you know, it comes back to what's the capital cost. I mean, if you can turn around and borrow money for 2 or 3% and you're earning 20% of your money, well, you're better off to earn the 20%. And, yeah. and so part of it comes, uh, it, it, part of it's from a psychological standpoint. And if we go back, you know, like when, when you and I first met, I, uh, for 90% of the time, would tell people to pay their debt off first. Now, in reality, I was, what I was dealing with, though, I, I was dealing with individuals that probably had, you know, they had 30 or 40 years before they were going to retire. And if they paid their debt off first and then uh, uh, went after investing, we would find that they'd have three to four times more money at retirement using that approach than trying to pay off the debt simultaneously, save for an emergency fund, simultaneously set up money for college, simultaneously put, uh, put money in a retirement account. That, that's diffusing the energy on it. And uh, by paying off the debt, and then after they pay off the debt, focusing on building a cash reserve, and then after they build a cash reserve, focus on uh, investing long term, they would have three to four times more money using the exact same dollars uh, when it came to retirement. Now, you know, so many people I'm talking with now, they want to be in that position in 10 years or less. And, you know, I've I've helped, what, 196 uh, business owners go from either bankrupt or, you know, pretty much living paycheck to paycheck to becoming multimillionaires in less than three years. Uh, so it's possible for entrepreneurs to be doing that in three to five years. But so, so if you're going to be looking at 10 years or less, then we almost, especially in this environment, we have to sit here and, and skip over the uh, debt and say, okay, let's focus the turbo margin on getting involved in investments that's going to beat the stock market. Because that's the other problem is that we've been conditioned to think that, you know, you can't beat the stock market. And the truth is, if you're doing traditional financial uh, investing and you're following the traditional approaches, that's a fairly accurate statement. There, there's plenty of research organizations, independent research organizations out there that suggest that 86% of the professional money managers out there do not do as well as the S&P 500 or, or match the market. So, you know, there, there's a high failure rate there. But then on the other hand, you know, you, you have 14% that uh, are matching the market on a consistent basis. And then you have people, uh, you know, a lot of people, I mean, I, I admire Warren Buffett. I've always said that. But there's a lot of unknown individuals that I know that have uh, performed as well as Warren Buffett. There's a reason why they haven't earned as much money. But in terms of their, their stock selection and uh, the results of their stock selection comparing it to Berkshire Hathaway, They've done, done very well. So it is possible to consistently, over a long period of time, beat the stock market, but you can't follow the traditional financial planning approach or the, you know, the traditional approach that the investment industry suggests. Uh, hey, down, Rand, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Randy. I was, well, I I was just going to bring no, something up. I, I, I was just going to say, you know, there's, there's a group out of Boston called Dalvar, D-A-L-V-A-R, and this is going back to the 90s, They've been uh, kind of measuring investor performance. There's a difference between investor performance versus investment. So if you look at someone that invests in the, in the S&P 500 index fund, the index fund may have averaged 10% over a 20-year period of time, but the investor may be only averaged 4 to 5% during that same time period because of the psychological ben- uh, ramifications and when they try to get in and out of the market. And, and they look at this whole group of investors, a, a, a large group, and, and what we'll find is that more often than not, the investor will only do half as well as whatever return the investment that they've been investing in has done. Uh, I gave an example that Peter Lynch, you know, he had the Magellan Fund that averaged 27%, and yet people that invested in the Magellan Fund for 20 years earn less than 8%. So there's a difference between what the investment's earning and the investor. So. And why is that? Is that is that is that because when you mentioned psychologically, um, they pull money out, they they try and time the market, they try and why? Let me just leave it at that. Why is that? 
Yeah, uh, and, and you touched on, on some key points. The, you know, one thing, when we look at the index, and you say the index uh, averages 10%, well, that's a hypothetical uh, fund because they're, they're, it's assuming there's not a cost of doing business. And yet most mutual funds will have internal expenses that eat away at it and chip away. Uh, if you look at something like a Vanguard 500 index fund, it's, it's fairly inexpensive, you know, and, and that's a better way to go. But, you know, there still might be something like 15 basis points that's chipping away. That's not a big deal. The main reason is investor emotion, just what, what you said. You know, they invest the – you know, when I'm, I look back over 30 years, I think, you know, what are some of the common mistakes that I see? And, and, and a real common theme I, that I see both with individual investors and professionals, and by professional, I'm talking about any financial professional that's out there working with individual clients, is that more often than not, they will do things at the wrong time. You know, uh, Buffett would say, and you, you'll keep hearing me come back, because, you know, Buffett was a disciple of Benjamin Graham, and I say I'm a, dis a disciple of, of uh, Warren Buffett. But, the, um, you know, he, he would say that, that you know, at, at the time to, to sell is at a point of peak optimism. And so what typically happens is people watch and they hear and they think, oh, wow, the market's doing great, the market's doing great. I mean, like right now, you know, uh, if, if we go back 2011, 2012, 13, 14, people started investing more and more back into the stock market. But back in 2009 and 10 and the first part of 2011, people were not investing. They had to wait and see things were recovering and that it was working well and now they're investing. Now what's happening, people's plowing money into the market right now. And, you know, I was talking with someone on the phone, uh, you know, across the country uh, last week and, and this person's, was talking with different investment advisors and wanting my, my guidance on which advisor he should should work with since I no longer work you know with, with clients like that and and uh, what was funny is that he interviewed four different advisors and they all told him that he shouldn't be concerned about a recession and that they don't think a recession is looming right now and uh, yet this person's planning on retiring in three years I would be surprised wow. if we don't see a recession within three years. And so they're making decisions right now like, hey, every, you know, it, it's sunshine and rainbows. And, it could, yeah. and, and so what happens then when the market drops, then they'll turn around and, and start bailing out because they don't know where the bottom is and the sky is falling. So it, it's, they, they invest when they ought to be scaling back, and then they cash out when they ought to be investing more, and that's human nature. And there's a lot of other reasons too, but those are the biggies. Yeah, Wow. You know, one thing I was going to come back to, because if some of our listeners are like, well, some of the investment stuff doesn't make as much, is not as applicable to me at this time. One thing you told me a long time ago uh, regarding this formula is that the deeper you are in debt, if you apply this formula uh, systematically and intensely, the faster you're be you will become a, a multimillionaire because um, as you accelerate your margin to pay off your debt, if you if you have the discipline to not change <laughs> dramatically mm -hmm. uh, your baseline, um, right. you will, that turbo margin will just will now plow over into uh, investment margin. So um, moving, I just wanted to clarify that real quick for everybody. Um, so, so, yeah, because just what I, what I told you back then, and, and, and you remembered it, and I forgot that I told you that uh, was that it's easier for a person to become a multimillionaire faster if they have if they start out with a lot of debt. And, and it's because you can, there's strategies to eliminate that debt quickly, and then once you eliminate the debt, you take all that money plus your turbo margin, and you drive that towards your, your uh, wealth accumulation And uh, it, it, because, you know, that money's already committed. So if we can redirect that money from debt because we paid your debt off, uh, you'll become rich a lot faster and, and, and a lot richer. So what makes your – so let's go through some of your kind of your wealth uh, investment strategy talk about first steps and then and what makes some of the things you've done with clients unique and I do want to leave time because I want to talk about uh, how you've built some really powerful relationships and gotten access to some uh, people that most people can't get access to I want to kind of pick your brain and grab your strategy from you on that okay um, yeah the, the uh, you know and, and a lot of people talk about money buckets and stuff and you know I, I can you know, I, I look back and I, you know, I think I've been talking about money buckets in one capacity or another probably for 35 years. So, you know, it is, there may be overlap with what they've heard elsewhere. But, but what, I, what I look at is let's focus on the turbo margin. 
And then once we have that turbo margin, the question is where are you investing that money? And so if we're going to invest it in, into the market, uh, you know, I, I look at it. You have to have your your three. You have your three buckets. You know, your your, your uh, one bucket would be your your cash reserve, and then you have a bucket that's going to be your your freedom bucket, and then another bucket's the get rich bucket. And uh, the freedom bucket, the purpose of that is to crank out um, off of uh, earnings, dividends, and interest, and, and royalties and such to crank out enough income there to replace your working income. That's what the freedom bucket's for. And the get rich bucket is a, is to allow you to build your wealth faster, and then at certain points you take money from the get rich bucket, drive it back into your freedom bucket, uh, you know, so you can just keep building that income, and, and that's your true passive income bucket, the freedom bucket is. So, the, so okay, so let me ahead. let me ask you uh, just kind of a uh, specific question on this on the freedom bucket. How much if someone has like a baseline lifestyle of two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, would they need in their freedom bucket for them to uh, be done? Like to to just uh, be conceptually done. So can, you, yeah. Like how, what's your suggestion there? Yep. Uh, you know, the, my suggestion is that, that you have yeah, now again, just like what we, you were talking earlier about, like interest rate stuff. You make decisions. Uh, you know, this this is a general rule, and there's going to be certain situations where you can adjust from it. Slide, but but what I would say is that you need to have for every forty to fifty thousand dollars of income. Uh, that you're wanting, you need to have a, a, about a million dollars of of an asset that's cranking up that income. Now, the uh, on Wall Street they have something that they call the four four percent rule, and the four four percent rule is this: it's saying that if you are if your investment portfolio is predominantly invested in the stock market, and you draw four percent of the account value out per year, and then and then you adjust for inflation each year thereafter. That money will last you 30 years. So what they're saying then is you need roughly a million dollars for every $40,000 of income, and you draw that money out just for inflation, and in about 30 years you'll be out of money. So back to your, you know, to answer your question specifically, what I would say is that if if you're averaging somewhere, you know, where where you're earning a dividend or something of four percent then you're looking at roughly four to five million dollars that you would want to have building up. But part of that freedom bucket could consist of, you know, for example, uh, you know, as your mastermind, we, we shared some different programs that were paying dividends of 5% to 8%. So if that's the case, you know, and, and if you can find that, then you probably want to have two and a half to $3 million of an investable asset. But on the other hand, you might end up owning a business or you might end up owning some kind of a cash machine out there that's spinning off royalties. And if they're spinning off royalties of like, say, 4% or 5%, that would reduce the amount of investable asset you had to have. But for the the group here, I would say that uh, you know plan on about one million dollars of investment for every forty thousand dollars you want of income. Uh, right. So you never found your you found yourself that money, and and so that's why you want to have the get rich bucket because the get rich bucket is going to allow you to to explosively generate and create that wealth because the get the purpose of the get rich bucket is to strive for. 20% annualized rate return or more. And you, you know, Ed, from, from sharing some stuff with you that, that um, you know, I, I've had opportunities that I could bring to clients that over, you know, a long period of time consistently, they were earning 30%, 40%, you know, uh, some that earn 96%. Now, I don't want to make that sound like that's easy, and I don't want to make it sound like pie in the sky. It's not like going out and just picking up coins. You know, it, it, it's, you know, those are rare opportunities, but they exist. And if you look at the stock market, if it's averaged 10% over 70 years, if you invest differently than what most people invest in the stock market, it is possible for you to, to over a long period of time, consist, and by long period of time, I mean, when I talk about there's consistency, to be earning 20% or better. You can earn 20% right. or better. And if you look at the people that are billionaires, they've been averaging 30 40 50% on an annualized basis to get there. So, so I want to, before we get, I want to, I want to go into the rule, the, the secret rules of the, of, of investors that most common people have no clue about, which is uh, some of these deals and some of these opportunities that most people don't have something to. What I just wanted to back up one step and say, you know, you could plunge a million, two million, three million, let's say four million on that 4% rule to, you know, have 200,000 or a quarter million dollars a year. And that, that question was pre, presupposing you aren't 
generating any uh, any uh, income or anything uh, ongoing, correct? Like I kind of the way I asked that question presupposed that I, you were just done, right? Where yep. most most yep. most of the guy, most of the guys and gals I know who are entrepreneurs or investors who are, who are hustlers. Um, I, they're never going to be done done. You know, like those guys are always going to be creating something to, um, but one thing I wanted to share was um, the reason why we teach the fundamentals of, uh, and the key elements of growing uh, a business like our product businesses our supplement businesses or, or info, information marketing businesses is because with, with say anywhere between 5,000 and 50,000 dollars, on the, on the low side of an investment, if you're willing to do the work to acquire the skill sets, um, you could eat, I, I never want to say easy because it's not easy, but in, in, after going through it, looking back, um, you could generate a business that pays you high six figures. And if, if you take the strategy of replacing yourself in the company, it's the same equivalent of, of going of plunging three million dollars into annuities or, or I mean to a, a dividends and um, getting royalties and it's it's but you you put sweat equity into that investment early on which built it up mm-hmm. uh, right so I just wanted to make that clarification because because you know because some people are like oh shit man I'm so far away from uh, putting all this cash away well hell you got to start where you're at and the way I've always done it is I started businesses from grassroots cash tight and focused on the core sales process. And once you dial in that core sales process, you got to make sure your margins are in place. And um, going back to unique abilities and, and superpowers is making sure you don't do all the stupid mistakes I did, which is scale too quickly, hire too many people, you know, uh, if that's not within your skill sets, you know. And so um, just in, in full circle, like we – I've found that we do – uh, run better companies when there's less of us. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, sure. Um, I was at the uh, Ed Sharon concert last night, right? And mm-hmm. he was on. He's this redhead dude. He's really cool. I think he's mid twenties, maybe late twenties. Phenomenal uh, singer. Do you know he came on stage and all he had in front of him was there was no band with him at all. He plays all his own music, and I don't know what machine it is, but he's capable of like recording a beat and a line and whatever. And he just quickly records it right there with his feet. And then he just goes on to the next track, the next track. And then bam, he plays his whole song all by himself. And as I was watching him, I was like, you know, that is the, that is the new entrepreneur of today. The guy who could fill an arena of, uh, you know, 40,000 people be 26 years old. And he's sitting there by himself. Now I know there's backstage stuff going on, but, uh, anyhow, that's highly leveraged. <laughs> that was my mm-hmm. point. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you brought up an a, a important point that I think we need to drive, and that is that for the listener, there's, there's not a reason for them to be discouraged by, by those numbers that I tossed out because I, I believe, and you know, when I look at all the different wealth vehicles, and, and I created a white paper with all the different wealth vehicles, I believe the absolute best wealth vehicle to become financially independent is to build a business. And that's why I started out talking about making the decision of building a business versus building a highly compensated self-employed business. And and if I, you know, knowing what I know now, you know, if, if I was in my 30s starting over again, I would strive to build a business that generated cash, and then I would turn around and say, how can I then take this and, and also build a business that's going to operate without me? But one mistake that you, you make with the idea of, of operating that business and, it's, and it just spinning out income to you by operating a business is that there are times that things can totally blow up on that. And I've seen that model happen. So unless you build a business the right way and build it in a big enough way, there's a, there's a high probability that some of the people working within your business, when you're, when you're now an absentee owner and you're just drawing for all practical purposes, the royalty checks or the dividends off that business, uh, the, the odds are stacked in your favor that it's, it's going to dissipate at some point. So you've got to build it big enough that it's actual perpetual income machine if you build that business. And, and I think that even if you're taking that path, 
it's still important to focus on the turbo margin and then investing that turbo margin in areas. You know, Branson has made the comment more than once that if he didn't have 400 different companies, which I think is, is you, know, uh, you know, he might not be as faring as well as he has, you know, all this. And when you look at the 400 companies, there's really only a few that really have knocked it out of the park. And um, so I think what's important for the listener, if they want to build a business, that is, would be my suggestion is that you do build a business. They definitely are going to be fortunate because they're tapping into your skill and expertise, your wisdom ed. So they have that unfair advantage, and they can really amp it up. But I, what I would suggest is to, to come up with that $5 million or the $2 million or whatever, it's not easy, but it's not hard. If you have the right strategy and you have the right mindset and you step away from traditional financial advice, it's, it's, it's possible to build that $3 million uh, in less than five years. It really is. Um. Okay, so let's talk about just for time's sake. Let's talk about your get rich, uh, your get rich bucket, and and I'd like to jump into like some of your specialty investments and some of the things that the, most of the public might not understand or even know exist. Yeah. Okay. The uh, you know the, the first thing I, I'll tell you on the get rich bucket is that I believe after watching what's happened, and you know you alluded earlier, Ed, that I'm quite a bit older than you, so I've seen a lot of the different economic cycles uh, that, that we've gone through. We probably should tell the listener that I'm now 156 years old. Uh, I just sound younger than that, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah. so, 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 but what I what I can say is that I don't believe, from what I've actually observed by being in the trenches and, and observing what's happened in my life, my client's life, but then other advisors and everybody out there, I, I don't buy into this asset allocation the way the industry teaches it. And um, then if you say, well, you know, who's Randy to, to uh, dispute that? Well, then what I would suggest is you look at, again, Warren Buffett's of the world, and you look at the Peter Lynch's of the world, and you look at the Carl Icahn's of the world, and, and you'll start seeing that none of those guys uh, buy into that same thing. And so I've attended some of Warren's conferences and that uh, he kind of makes fun of, of the asset allocation model. And so that's just really for professors that's trying to get tenure, you know. So w w when we talk about especially investments, I think on the get rich bucket, number one is to concentrate. You know, some people say that, uh, I think it was Hunt or Getty used to say, put all your eggs in one basket and watch the basket, but I, I traced it back, and Andrew Carnegie this is the first one I could find, and probably somebody said it before him, and, and that's really true. Most people, are they're sold on this idea of diversifying, so the get-rich bucket, the especially things that most people aren't aware, I would say focus on just a few things. You know, don't buy or own more than 20 stocks, and if you get to the point where you only owe 10 stocks, that's even better if they're, if they're the right stocks. And then there's, there's especially investments out there like the hedge funds. You know, there are some really awesome hedge funds out there. And then there's a whole bunch of other kind of hedge funds. And the other kind of hedge funds are the ones that the average investor uh, can get access to. But the ones that are doing the great job, it's, it's reserved for the people that are of billionaire status and they have large amounts of money. And so, fortunately, with some of the people that I've worked with in the past that were billionaires and not non-billionaires, I was able to introduce them to some of the hedge fund uh, programs that would earn you know, 40% to 60% on an annualized basis. And the hedge fund managers really push hard to get those results on a year-by-year -year basis. There's, the industry talks about something called relative returns, and a hedge fund manager talks about actual returns. They get paid on the results they get on a year-by-year -year basis. Now, there are mutual funds out there now that are uh, uh, kind of managing like hedge funds, and my suggestion is stay away from them. Uh, there are mutual funds out there that's investing in futures. So uh, you know, most of the higher net worth people that I've worked with, they will invest in futures. They'll hedge for when the market is going down and they'll, they'll own investments for when the market's really ramping up. Uh, I shared with you, there's excuse me, another one of my colleagues, that what he will do is most people uh, may have heard of something called a real estate investment trust. Instead of going out and buying a real estate investment trust or investing in it like the average investor, he does something where it's the second market. He'll go out and he'll find a real estate investment trust that's not publicly traded on, on like the New York Stock Exchange, 
And then he'll look at that and say, okay, part of it has been performing well, part of it's been performing horrible. I'm going to buy this for pennies on the dollar, and I think I can generate this 30% return, but in the event that I can't generate the 30% return, let me buy it a little bit cheaper so I have a margin in there in case I miscalculate it. And he will go out and, and buy real estate investment trusts, tear them apart, repackage them, put them out in the marketplace. And uh, I've been involved in 25 different programs with him, and the worst one averaged 30%, and the best one averaged 96%. That's an annualized basis over like an eight-year period of time. So imagine what your portfolio would do if you had a 96% rate of return each year for eight years, you know. And, uh, you know, if you average 30%, your money's going to double every 2.4 years. And so that's, that's what I would encourage the investors, you know, that's interested in the call here is to try to look for opportunities where they can invest and double their money every two, two and a half years. And, um, you know, another investment would be there was a bank – on one of the islands, and uh, you know, back when CDs were paying more than they are now, you know, back when they were the CDs were like one and a half to two percent, you could get a guaranteed account at this this island bank, and and it was insured, and it was paying about eight percent guaranteed. So right. those opportunities are available for uh, you know the, the really wealthy individuals, and and you know, you know Ed, I'm in the process of, of trying to pull together a package where we could take, uh, you know, the average entrepreneur that's wanting to invest and they don't need to have millions of dollars. You know, they, they just need to have, you know, six figure uh, portfolio, 100,000 to 300,000, 500,000. And uh, we want to make those kind of programs available to them. And uh, awesome. you know, there's, there's, there's one simple program that we have that if we look at over the last 20 years. The, uh, if you'd invested a hundred thousand dollars and just rounding the numbers off, if you invest 100,000 in the S&P 500, 20 years later, uh, the S&P 100,000 grew to like 600,000. Now that Dow bar that I was talking about earlier, they found that the investors that invested 100,000 during the same time period did right around 4%, uh, or, or not 4%, 400,000. That's 453,000. Yeah. And then uh, if you use that focused investment strategy that I talked about, uh, that was uh, what 3.2 million dollars that it grew. So the S and P grew at 100,000. Wow. This is 3.2, and it's with less risk. But I think I think I'm probably throwing numbers around too much to be on a podcast, you know. Well, you know, let's. Uh, this is all. This is all awesome. I, for time's sake, I just want to make sure uh, I respect your time on this. Let's switch um, slightly. You've worked with a lot of uh, celebrities. You've uh, had act. You 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 figured out a way to. Um, I, I don't know what you told me. How, how did you start getting into working with high profile people? Um, and then for our listeners to make it actually relevant, what is that? What is maybe one strategy you could share with people that, that is tangible and valuable, um, for them so that they, you know, there's, I, I asked Rowan Frazier this on one of my first podcasts. Uh, I said, you know, everybody thinks they want to be somewhere else than they are, and they need to know somebody they don't. And there's like this perceptual thing, like you're always climbing the mountain. Um, and yet, then also, I think I have a question that it's a follow up. So I'll let you answer that first. Like, so, a, how did you get into uh, working with higher profile celebrities and uh, more influencer people? And then, B, what's one valuable strategy that someone who's in, not in the financial world, per se, could, utilize, could use to, uh, for, their, for themselves? Okay. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, it kind of happened by accident. I think a lot of great things, you know, it, it's not really an accident, per se, but when you're doing certain things and you're playing to your superpower, if you talk about it, it just kind of leads you that way if you keep paying attention. So I... Uh, what happened, I, I, as I mentioned, I'm a, a serial entrepreneur. I've started and sold 18 different companies. And the uh, last major company I had was turned out to be a, a wealth management firm, and, and uh, it was one of the most successful ones in, in the country. Uh, and it, it, it became too easy for me. Um, and as an entrepreneur, you know, when you get bored, you either try to figure out a way to create a mess so you have buyers to put out or you figure out how to pursue opportunities. And, and um you know, I had had a lot of people relying on me on this this company that I built, 
but yet I was bored. And uh, so to try to put a little bit more excitement into it, I thought, well, just for sport, I think what I'm going to do is, is approach it. And I never built my business because I'm not a typical sales person. I'm kind of like a timid, shy, laid-back kind of a, a person. So I'm not the kind of guy to get on the phone and making cold calls and that kind of stuff. That's never been my, my style. But I, uh, I just really was desperate with the um, – Things were just too easy. You know, we were making money, doing a great job for our clients. The business was growing great. It was easy, and I was bored. And so I thought to put a little excitement into it, I'm just going to start. Uh, I, I call it doing it for sport, reaching out to high-profile individuals and uh, seeing if I can't uh, get a face-to-face meeting with them and somehow add value to their life. And that's that's really how how it started. And uh, so, you know, I don't know the, how comfortable I can feel mentioning names here, but there was like in Inc. Magazine, the, the uh, one of the, the, the top company that was the fastest growing company, uh, you know, I, I, I was found that I was really fascinated by that company, so I tried calling uh, calling a CEO, and, uh, and and so, you know, it, it, it didn't come easy. I had, had to make a lot of different phone calls, but the first thing that I did was, and I, I didn't do this strategically, I just did it being who I am. You know, I treated the gatekeepers really nice. And um, so I would call back at different times, and they would say, is this Randy from Illinois? You know, because I have that little bit of a southern twang. And, and, and so whenever I would call this guy, uh, he, he would not be available. And so one day I call, and um, I, I can't remember her name now because it's been years ago, but she says, hey, Randy. She says, he's actually here today. She says, but I think he's in the restroom. And she said, if you'll wait for me, if you, if you can wait a few minutes, she said, I'll go stand by the door. And when he comes out, I'll grab him. And uh, so, 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 so that's what happens. She stands by the door, and, and so I'm going to I'm going to be uh, in in that that city in a few weeks. And I thought if I could get this thing set up and, and maybe meet with him when I, when I'm there. And so that was kind of the start, and that that gave me confidence. So uh, I mean, he he was a nice guy. Uh, it took me probably, you know, I'm, I I can't quite remember. It's been a long time, but I'm going to say probably six months uh, of, of following up. To, uh, and, and, you know, I would be nice and chat up with the, with the uh, assistant that when I'd call, but he'd send it to her time and everything else. And, and so she became a, an advocate for me and, and uh, uh, or an ambassador for me and, and uh, grabbed him and we had a conversation and then he agreed to meet and that was cool. And so I started doing that. And, and so I'd, I'd have a situation that I would focus on one person and I would just go after that one person I had an interest in meeting until I either got the meeting or they told me to go away. And, uh, and and then once I had that happen, so I built a list. You know, I, I came up with a list of, of individuals that I just thought I would like to have a shot at helping them financially. And um, and so once I had that one done, checked off the list, then I went after another. So then I happened to be at a financial conference, and there was another high-profile celebrity that happened to be a billionaire. And uh, he gave his presentation, and, uh, you know, the uh, – at the end, they had the microphones, kind of like the Oprah early days, Donahue style, and uh, all these financial advisors were asking him questions. Well, one of the things that he did to uh, thwart the group was he said that his banker wanted to introduce him to a financial planner, and he asked the financial planner what his uh, net worth was, but wasn't worth more than a billion dollars, then what's he going to teach him? And and I he did that to kind of shut down all the planners, and so... So when I got up there, I told him, I said, you know, I understand uh, that your financial net worth is greater than mine, but if it comes to the, uh, uh, um, I, and I can't remember the exact words I used, it was better than what I'm getting right now, but something like, but, it, but if we look at the idea, the net worth of the ideas uh, as it relates to strategy, then I think that probably uh, uh, we'll be on par. And I asked him in front of that group, I said, you know, if no one's approached you yet, uh, you know, can I have 10 minutes of your time after your, after your session? And uh, so, so was first, the first strategy I would tell is make a list of who you'd like to talk to. And the second strategy then is to have the, the antenna up where you're always looking for that opportunity. I mean, here I was. Now, the flip side, over 4,000 financial people were in the audience. And I was running the risk of looking like a real idiot and, and embarrassing myself in front of my peers and colleagues, right? But yeah. I did it, and, you know, it was interesting. Half the group thought it was awesome what I did, and the other half thought it was terrible what I did. And, and what this person had me do, they, they had me talk to their attorney. Uh, when I went up afterwards, they gave me the name of their, their personal attorney to call. And when I called the personal attorney, he said, well, you have to understand that this guy's just really a nice guy, and he can't say no. I'm the guy that gets to say no. 
And uh, I said, well, that's fair enough. And then he proceeded to tell me all the things they had done and why he didn't need my help. And I said, well, it sounds like you've done everything perfect. And I, I applaud you for that. And he said, well, I wouldn't call it perfect. And I said, well, oh, really? Well, tell me about that. And so they started explaining to me that they tried for years and years and years to solve this one problem, but they couldn't solve it. And it's more of a philosophical problem, and I, but, it, but, it, but it had to tie in with money. And I said, well, I, you know, I, I, I can see why that's tough, and I don't really know that I could come up with any ideas, but if by chance I could come up with some potential solutions, you want me to call you, or would you rather me just go away and not bother you anymore? <laughs> you know, if you think you can solve it, and, and so the uh, so I, I think the second thing is that if you're approaching someone, because to approach them, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to approach them with the idea of, hey, I'm a nice guy, why don't you see me? They're busy. You, you you have to find out how you might be able to add value to their life, and that's what I was doing. My my vehicle happened to be the financial vehicle, but whatever you're doing, you need to figure out a way to tap into how you can add value to their life. That's very important because if you can't add value to their life, you shouldn't be wasting their time, uh, right. and they're not going to let you. They're not going to let you do it, right? So in this case, I talked to the attorney, and he planned to shut me down. And I don't know, six months or I don't know, several months later, I come up with some potential ideas, and, and I called him up, and he said, "Yeah," he says, "Come on out, let's talk." And so I go and I, I have a conversation with him, and they're like blown away. The next thing I know, I'm on a private jet going to Florida to meet this person, and. Now, what happened, I found, is that with the celebrities, and, and, and this was a business celebrity, uh, and I've worked with entertainment celebrities, and, and it's, you know, we've all heard it's a small world, and it really, really is. They talk among themselves. There, there was another, um, an, another celebrity, who, uh, actually he was a celebrity CEO, and I got with him through a referral of someone else, and our connection was talking about mountain climbing. So, so you know, you, you have to be able to add value to their life. But the other part is find out what their personal passions are, and if there's a way that you can connect with that, that's the other part of the strategy. And as a result of, of that introduction, there was a guy that owned a, a, a oil company that introduced me to this CEO, and those guys were climbing mountains together, and I was a mountain climber, and um, so, so we connected. And then off of that CEO, he introduced me to some really famous movie stars. And then from that, I was uh, introduced to the CEO of a top inter entertainment industry. And then if we fast forward a few years later, uh, I'm talking with a, with a, a lady that's an a, you know, entertainment celebrity. And um, she had interest in, in, in talking with me, and she just so happened to be having dinner uh, with a guy in California, and my name came up, and then this other guy in Florida happened to be, so the, the three of them, it was it solidified. So it's really kind of like that six degrees piece. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so, it, so it comes back to finding out how to deliver value to them, finding out something that they're personally passionate about, enlisting their team to help you get in front of them, and, uh, and then delivering on your promises. And then, it, and then if you uh, deliver on the promises and, and the good, then... They're in, and they're going to tell other people about you because they're they're very much they, they won't they won't talk publicly. That's the other thing I found is that when you're working with with the A-list celebrities and you're working with the billionaires, they don't like to share because they kind of want to. I mean, they do like to share, but they don't like to share at least in the financial world. They want to keep me uh, secret. They really like the idea that I wasn't out there, you know, uh, doing all kinds of crazy stuff on the from their perspective, crazy stuff on the internet, and that they because if people can't find me and identify me, then their stuff's safer too. So, right, right, right. So you, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, maybe you have some yeah. specific questions, Ed, because you know, you know more of the backstory of, of, and you know the specific individual, so there might be some no, clarification. I, 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 yeah, I think, I think that was great. I think the one thing that you mentioned that was just superb there was, you know, everybody who is, is uh, successful or moving towards a goal they're not sitting around waiting for people to call them so they can spend time on the phone or get more emails, but everybody has a problem or two that they just can't afford mental bandwidth or like they have those. I'd like to solve this one thing. or I'd like to see this. And like for me right now, I look for hustlers. I look for guys who are 10 years younger than me and age is not, not the deal. But guys are who had the same attitude I had 12 years ago where they are willing to run through a brick wall and work all night long to crack uh, a code of something, you know. And so 
that's kind of like what I'm looking for now uh, when people come to me and they're like, well, hey, I'd, I'd like to do this for you. Or no one does that. They always ask for advice or ask for help, which is fine. Um, but that doesn't give them or they're trying to sell you on a service, which those are all about them strategies, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So what's, what's um, I guess what is probably one of, this is probably my last question about celebrities, uh, but what's probably one of the things you didn't expect with working with, and I want to, it's kind of a generalization uh, question, but um, did, that you found working with them? Like, did you find it once, did, did, after a while, did you get bored there too? Yeah, I did. Uh, the, uh, when, it first, when it first started, it, it was exciting, you know, and it's really cool because a whole different world opened up, you know, uh, being able to, you know, walk down the red carpet at the award shows and, and sit in the same area with the, you know, with the A-listers and then do the after parties with them and, and as their guest, that was all fun. And, uh, you know, so, so it's like anything, you know, when, when you're something new like that and there's the, the glamorous part and stuff, it was exciting. And then what happened was that it's, you know, it, it takes on a life of its own because, you know, the, the stuff they have going on is, is uh, so intense that um, it, 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 it takes the fun away from it because you, you had to, you know, I, I built my life around being really free and, uh, you know, I, I you know, I had a lot of freedom. And when you get involved working with, now if you're just doing one or two, it's probably not too bad, but when you get involved with, with you know, like a couple dozen, uh, it, it, it really becomes all-consuming. And you have to be on call. I mean, I would get calls like at 2 o'clock in the morning. I would get calls at, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning. You know, I'd, I'd get a call at 11 o'clock in the morning saying, hey, can you be at the airport in, in 45 minutes because we want to pick you up? Uh, you know, so that that stuff uh, re- really really grates on you, and then and then you have uh, I don't want this to sound negative because it was uh, it, you know it, it wasn't negative, but but it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows either. Um, what, one of the things that really surprised me on the um, you know dealing with the group as a whole is that you you had to have the antenna up for who was really authentic and and who was just plastic. Um, because that there are, there are a lot of plastic people surrounding them. They, they try to keep that insulated, but uh, it, it, so many people have their own agenda, but they're trying to masquerade that agenda, and so you never really know the truth of what you're what you're dealing with in, in many cases. Now, if you're not dealing with financial stuff, that's probably not that big of an issue. And then, you know, for a few of the other people, they they hired a a, a significant size support team, and then I was like the orchestrator of it, and and. Uh, you know, I was kind of in charge of everything, including all their other financial advisors and all the other support teams that they had. And uh, so it just it really took on a life of, like, starting your own business when you're starting it and then multiply it, like, by 10, and that's the amount yeah. of stuff. So that's the best I can tell you. It's a fun place to go and make connections. Uh, because of, of the money, if, if I wasn't doing money and I was doing things like personal training or supplements or stuff like that, I could probably do name dropping and use them in, in my marketing material. But with the agreements I had with them, um, I couldn't do it. So it's not like I, I received celebrity endorsement that would help me from a business standpoint, uh, whereas a lot of people in this call could probably benefit with celebrity-style endorsements. Right, right, right. Well, you know what's positive today, man, is that you can, with transparency of the Internet, just by creating value for people, um, you can shortcut a lot of the old school marketing of getting celebrities to endorse you or hiring people to do that just simply by being freaking good at what you do and uh, creating that value. So, um, so hey, wrapping up here, buddy, I know I, I, I'm over time on you. So um, last question is what's next for Randy? Davis, and um, how could people get in touch with you if they would like to uh, make a connection? Okay, thanks. Yeah, you know, it, it's really cool because, as you know, I've been on a, a kind of sabbatical since 2008 trying to figure out. So I, I sold my, my uh, last major business in 2008, and then I've just been kind of playing around saying, okay, what, I, you know, I want to do something that contributes and makes a difference, but I had to figure out. <laughs> to use your term, line, you know, something that lines up my superpowers. And, uh, you know, and if, and if I don't enjoy doing it, I'm not going to do it because it's not about the money. It's it's about uh, it's about the challenge. I, I love the money part for the challenge. But uh, so, so 
I've, I've spent several years trying to figure out what I want to do and um, working through a process. So, here, so here's what I came up with and, and what I'm uh, in, about to launch I think is going to be really cool. It's a, it's a program called Society World Class Investors. And it's, it's only for entrepreneurs. And it's for entrepreneurs that, you know, it, it, it will, I think, be very useful. You know, like when, when they have a program like yours, Ed, that's just incredible in teaching them how to, how to generate the cash and, and, and become a cash machine. You know, it's valuable there. But what I'm going to do is teach them the simplified way. I want to, you know, instead of making this thing complex, let's make it simple. And here's some very simple things you can do to accelerate your wealth now. And then once we start accelerating that wealth, I want to open up the doors to the relationships that I had working with the uh, high-profile individuals that we talked about and bring investment opportunities to this group that uh, they wouldn't be able to uh, uh, get out on their own because you know very few people can get access to that. And uh, you know, and again, I'm not I'm not a, a licensed professional. I, I ended up uh, retiring, resigning my my uh, licensing, so I'm not acting in the capacity of an advisor or anything. But it's it's I'm going to teach, I'm going to train, and then I'm going to uh, let them have access to. Uh, investments that you know make them aware of those investments and open the doors. And if they want to walk into that door and invest in that area, great. And if they don't, that's fine. And then I'm going to also have some of the different uh, business icons and the celebrities and, and that that I've worked with uh, come in at different times to meet with them and and and, and tie that in with some teaching and, and training. So that's that's the passion that I'm working on, and uh, I'm totally stoked about it. So if they want to, uh, you know, and, and this is something where it's an application process and it's not a marketing gimmick, it, it truly is application. Um, and it's being final stages of development right now. And so we're going to be rolling that out shortly. And if, they, if I don't have a website, we're going to, we really need to keep this secret uh, so, uh, so that it's good for the people that's in the program. And if they want to reach me, just well, uh, hey, Rand, me Randy, ex- explain because you're 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 on a podcast now, so you, it's not secret in that you're not. I <laughs> think people can't tell anybody about it. But you're, the reason why the group is um, you're forming is is a society, and, and inside of it, like the investments are secret. Why is that? Just so everybody under- clarify that for a second. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ed. Thank you. Um, yeah, what I'm referring to about secret, like like inside the society. Uh, the investments that we expose you to, they're kept secret because there's a supply demand. And if it's if it's out there public, and there's you know other people knowing that you have access to, to this type of investment, you're gonna think, well, if you can have access to this, why can't I? And then when that happens, um, it, it's gonna run it for everyone. So that investment would go away and it wouldn't be available for other people because they can't. You, know, you can't make it available to all the Americans that would want to do it. And it's because there's certain restrictions on each one of those investments of how many investors they can have in it. And uh, so the, the, the worst thing that we could have happen is where all of a sudden now there's a million Americans that's wanting those kind of investments. And then at that point, it's going to revert back to the billionaires and, and it's not going to be available um, you know, for the individuals. Did, did I explain that uh, yeah. in the way yeah, that I that's per- yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. So, yeah, it's, it, you know, everything, everything's legal and it's above board. There, there's, you know, it's, it's, none of this is, is scary, crazy stuff, but it's just it's a supply-demand thing. And like a lot of the investments, they can only have 99 people in there. Okay, so if yeah. it opens up to the whole universe, now we have a problem. Correct. Great, man. So um, uh, how could they – how would you like them to – would you like them to email you or – yeah, you know, right now, uh, email would be the best way to reach me. So that would be Randy's personal assistant. I know that's a mouthful. Randy's personal assistant at Gmail. And then in the subject line, just say, tell me more. I'll know that's about the society. And you're not under any obligation by doing that, obviously. But um, awesome. that'd be the best awesome. way. Awesome. Dude, well, you, uh, you've you been awesome today. I appreciate your uh, insights, your time, your wisdom. Um, this is definitely one that that I'm going to re-listen to, and I know many of our listeners will as well. So uh, you have an awesome, tremendous day, uh, Randy, and, and thanks for being on the Ed O'Keefe Show. Hey, Ed, thanks for having me. It was great to be with you. And just so your listeners know, uh, I've had a chance to meet a large number of people over the years, 
and Ed is a true gem and a treasure and a genius, so tap into his brilliance, man, because I, I am. Uh, you know, Ed, Ed's kind of role reverse. He, he talks about me being his mentor, but in, in other areas, Ed's mentoring me, so I really appreciate and, and respect Ed. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> You're the best, buddy. Take care. <laughs>